Hi, my name is Yulian, and I'm an Android developer at Jet.com. For those of you who probably have never heard about the company, it's uh, an e-commerce company located in Hubaka, New Jersey. And uh, we basically uh, currently belong to Walmart.com, so we got acquired August last year. So, and one of the biggest, probably, and innovative stuff and biggest project that we've uh, recently finished is Instant Apps. So right before Google I.O. in April last year, we launched the first multi-feature Instant App, and uh, it was a huge success. So today I would love to share with you uh, our experience and provide some practical tips on how you can make your apps instant. But uh, before we actually do a deep tech dive into how to build an Instant App, let's talk about why we need Instant Apps, right, and what problems they actually solve. So let's take a step back and talk about mobile evolution. And you probably remember those first pre-built applications on the devices, right? They were in black and white with no animation like calculator and snag game. So pretty boring, not exciting, but still they were our first applications and we kind of were happy about that. Then we stepped into the era of the so-called mobile web pages, right? And mobile web opened up a lot of opportunities for us to browse the internet and search for the information we needed, right? But the experience was super, super painful. The tags got cut off, the images didn't render correctly, right? So it was a very uh, painful and not really delightful experience to, uh, to have on the device. Later, we stepped into the ear of the so-called optimized mobile web pages. So most of the features that are currently being supported on desktop applications are supported on uh, um, mobile, uh, mobile web pages, right? And uh, it's really nice. It's pretty smooth experience. So it goes in parity with desktop applications. Pretty much simultaneously, we started to enjoy our store applications, or the so-called native applications, right? And uh, we love our Google Play, right? There is an application for almost every use case in life. So we got a new device, we install an application, then we keep installing, keep installing, keep installing, until we run into a space issue, right? Uh, how often has it happened to you when you're in the middle of a very important process, you're trying to install the application, you're in the middle of the installation process, and then the system tells you, hey, hey, back up, there is not enough memory, right? So you have to take a step back, you have to delete all your media files, right? You have to, uh, I mean, not all the media files, but the ones that you don't need anymore, go through your applications list, evaluate which ones you have not been using in a while, you don't need it. So a lot of, a lot of, issues, it's a very painful, very cumbersome, and time-consuming process, right? Nobody wants to deal with this. So this is where Instant App shines. So Instant App is a new type of the, op uh, a new type of the application that does not require installation. So um, we'll definitely dive into how it works under the hood, but at the beginning, let's look at the demo and what actually happens. So you can see a Jet.com application um, in the middle of the screen, right? So I'm uninstalling it. So I don't have an installable application anymore. And I open Chrome and I type in Jet camera, right? I need a new camera. And then you can see a list of URL addresses with a gray text instant next to the URL addresses. So once I click on the URL address, what happens is that a truly native application is being downloaded on the device just within a few seconds, right? And the truly native application is on your device. So you didn't have to go to the Google Play Store to install it. You didn't have to wait until the whole application is being downloaded. Everything is super fast, super performant, and super frictionless, right? So when we think about Instant Apps, I want you to think about it as a new type of the application that does not require installation, and that absorbs the benefits of both worlds. So it takes the best parts from the mobile web, and it takes the best features from the native applications. So again, just to reiterate, the core of Instant App is a native uh, core, right? So we still have material design, navigation. You still have to write your Instant App in Kotlin or Java or whatever you prefer. So it's a truly native application. But at the same time, it takes some mobile web features, such as space-friendly character and no need to install the application through Google Play Store. So what happens is, once the user clicks on a URL address, the application is being, part of the application is being downloaded on the device. And then it's being cached there on the device. So once you keep using your Instant App, it's still on the device. 
but once you stop using the application and the uh, system is under memory pressure, right, then the instant app that have not been used in a while are being wiped off from your device. So basically, the functionality or responsibility of installation and uninstallation of applications is being handed over to the system. And if all our applications are instant apps, you basically don't need to worry about memory issue anymore. Um, so, we as developers love the idea of instant apps, but doesn't really mean that we have to create a new application and support both of them, our regular installable application and instant app? Fortunately, no. So currently, uh, it's uh, a really nice add up to instant apps is that it can share the same code base with your regular installable application. One of the specificity of Instant App is that it has to be multi-module project. So I would assume that uh, probably most of you um, and most of the applications on Google Play Store have uh, one module application, right? So you have one module where all the code lives. So this is an anti-pattern in the world of Instant Apps. You actually have to modularize your application. And I know it probably may sound a little bit abstract, so in the next few slides, we actually go through specific steps on how to modularize the application and what steps to do to basically build an instant app. As you've seen from the demo, instant app is a very performance quick experience and everybody wants to keep it this way. So there are some constraints that we have to adhere as developers. And one of the constraints is a four megabyte size limit per module that you're adding within your instant um, applications. And I know most of you think, oh, Yulia, come on, this is 2017, and most applications are like 50, 60, 40 um, megabyte, right? And uh, four megabyte size limit seems like a luxury for ours as developers, right? Seems like a very unrealistic, magical number that's hard to reach. And this is actually the situation where uh, my team was when we decided to build an instant app. Our application was a little bit over 17 megabytes size limit, and I didn't believe it can happen. But in the next few slides, I will provide, again, some practical tips on how to scale your application from X megabyte size to 4 megabyte size. Currently, instant apps are being supported on the API level 23 and above. So Google is working to support instant apps on uh, lower API levels. And uh, another specificity of Instant App is that it's URL responsive. So in order to launch an Instant App, you have to click on a URL address. So uh, one of the application, uh, one of the questions that I uh, just recently got is, okay, I'm building my Instant App, I'm getting an APK, but how do you embed an APK into a browser, right? Because you've seen that I launched Instant App through Chrome. So in reality, Instant App does not really have anything to do with browser. So what happens is you're creating a unique URL address. So Instant App URL address, in my case, is httpsj.com. And then what happens is that this, once the user clicks on the URL address, it's being handed over to Google Play Store. And then Google Play Store is trying to find a matching Instant App APK. So yeah, is a matching Instant app, uh, app APK found, then it's being downloaded on the device, and user can enjoy a nice and smooth Instant App experience. But if the APK is not being found, then what happens is this URL address is being sent over to the Android system, and Android system handles it like any other URL addresses, which is what will go to the mobile web. Uh, so one of the most important things that you have to keep in mind is when you're creating your Instant App URL addresses, you have to make sure that they match with mobile web URL addresses. And why is that important? So imagine I create um, a unique Instant App URL address that doesn't have a matching uh, mobile web URL address. So once the user, and user, user takes a KitKat device, so if the user clicks on such a URL address on a KitKat device, what happens is the user will land in uh, 404 page no found experience because KitKat devices do not support instant app URL addresses, right? I mean, they d generally do not support instant apps. So in order to prevent this scenario, you have to make sure that your instant app URL addresses match with your mobile web URL addresses. So on the devices where instant apps are supported, instant app experience will be delivered. But on the devices where instant apps are not being supported, the user backfall to your mobile web application. So just make sure there is the equality between the URL addresses. As you can probably guess, the place where we define our Instant App URL addresses will be our manifest Android manifest file. So for each and every activity that serves as an entry point into your Instant application, you have to add an intent filter. And intent filter looks like any other intent filters. So you have to specify scheme, host, and path prefix. 
And uh, you also have to define action view and uh, two category, uh, categories, browsable and default. Uh, one of the new tags that has been introduced in the instant app context is uh, Android order. So, and this tag is important for cases when you have two activities, and both activities will basically have uh, the same um, intent filter, right? And they will respond to the same URL address. So in order to tell the system and your application which activity will get launched over the other one and will take precedence, you have to specify Android order. So the activity with a higher order number will get launched over the other uh, activity. So there are two types of instant apps, or probably better say there are two approaches how you can build your instant apps. One of them is a single feature instant app, and another one is a multi-feature instant app. And as you can probably guess from the images, right, and the names of the approaches, multi-feature instant app is focused on building independent components that would coexist next to each other. And single feature instant app is all about building just one foundation uh, that was, would, would live within your um, instant app. And uh, now probably let's start to dig deeper into each approach and see what are the benefits and uh, what are the issues with each of them. And we'll start with the easiest approach, which is a single feature instant app. Um, yeah, it's probably one of the uh, best way to start building instant app and play with it and see um, how it works. So imagine we have just one module, right? Currently we have our regular installable application. All our code lives within one module, which is app module. So when you decided to build an instant app, the first thing you have to do is to add a new module to your project. So you have to add a base module. Then you have to move all of the code from the app module to the base module. So currently, our app module is empty. It doesn't have any resources or source files. Everything is relocated to the base module. Then we have to provide the dependency of the app module on the base module. Then the next step to take is to add a new module, which is instant app module. Again, it will be empty. It won't have any resources or source files. And it will also depend on the base module. And that's pretty much it. So uh, as you can see, Instant App is not about adding extra code to your application, right? It's more about uh, shifting files around, adding extra modules, and modularizing the whole application. So, um, but currently we have three modules, right? Definitely there should be some connections between them. And the place where we usually specify the connections between modules are our build gradle files, right? So let's start with the build gradle file of the base module. So in the base module, you have to specify a new plugin, com.android.feature. In the default, um, closure, def default config closure of the Android, um, you have to set an attribute base feature to true. And why is that important? If you remember on the previous slide, what we've done, we moved all of our code from the app module to the base module, right? So all of our business logic, most of the stuff is located in the base module. So base module is that center of your application that all the modules have to refer to. And uh, in the dependencies block, you can see that we just need to specify regular uh, dependencies uh, that uh, you would normally specify in your app module. Build a, gradle of the, uh, build a Gradle file of the app module would have our well-known plugin, com.android.application, so the plugin is the same. But in the dependencies block, you don't have to specify any more specific dependencies. We've done it already in the base module. And just, just because base module is the foundation of the whole application, uh, app module needs to refer to the base module. So the configuration implementation project will basically establish this connection between the app module and the base module. Build a Gradle file of the instant app module uh, will have a different plugin. It's app. In the dependencies block, we pretty much do the same thing as we've done in the app module. So we have to uh, set a connection um, of the instant app module with the base module through the configuration um, line implementation project. So that's pretty much it. So we modularize our application, right? And uh, we establish the connections between different modules through uh, build and gradle uh, files. And uh, our instant app is ready to go. But there is an issue with single feature instant app. 
And the issue is a four megabyte size limit. So we moved all of this stuff from the app module to the base module. So we just have one base module, right? And uh, once you reach four megabyte size limit within your base module, there is no space to grow. So you cannot add extra features, you cannot add extra functionality to your application because Google Play Store will reject your instant app when you will try to upload it to the instant app channel. So this is where multi-feature instant app comes into play and solves the problem. So in multi-feature instant app, what happens is instead of moving all of the code into the base module, we have to create the so-called feature module. So we have to break our business logic um, on independent components that would basically be uh, packaged separately into each, in, uh, into each separate feature module. So, and there is no really limit to how many feature modules you can build. Uh, so this is a big difference between multi-feature and single-feature instant app. So I know that probably uh, the, the, this definition feature module sounds very abstract to you. So let's take, for example, our Jet.com application, and I would love to share with you all the features that we decided to keep separate and um, independent uh, in our instant app. So once again, Jet.com is an e-commerce company. We sell stuff online. And uh, this is the current features that we're supporting within instant apps. So there is a PLP page or the so-called product list page. Um, basically, it provides um, a list of products that a user is searching for. And then there is a PDP or product detail page, which provides detailed information about a specific product. Then cart page is responsible for a checkout process and some discounts, applications, and stuff like this. And order detail page, uh, responsible for summing up the most recently placed order. So... Um, if you look at these features, right, all of them don't really intersect with the other ones, right? They live independently. They have this core business logic, right? And um, it doesn't mean that um, each and every feature model has just one activity. There should be several. But usually, a uh, feature model would, would be associated with just one primary activity. <laughs> so, um, again, what we've done, we took our app module, right, and we broke it into feature modules. But if you think about it logically, right, there is still some uh, code that will be repeated within our feature modules, such as networking layer, analytics managers, account management, and a lot of information that will be shared between feature modules. And we as the developers don't want to duplicate this information, right? We don't want to write retrofit service in each and every module. So what we have to do is we have to add a base module to our multi-feature instant app. So, and base module is the so-called shared repository, which will have all the um, stuff that will be pulled in into any of the feature modules. So in order not to duplicate all of the logic in each and every feature module, move it to the base module and provide the dependency of the feature modules on the base module. So uh, that's it as far as modularization of the application is concerned, but we didn't really build an instant app. And the process of building instant app is pretty trivial. We're adding a new module, which is instant app module. And then we have to provide the dependencies of the instant app module on the feature modules. So, and uh, that's pretty much it. So once again, the bottom level module, right, is our shared repository of uh, the um, logic that will be pulled into the feature module, such as networking layer, account management, uh, analytics stuff, whatever is shared between all of the components of the application has to be moved to the base module. Feature modules are independent component. They will be responsible for a specific, um, specific uh, business logic, right, a specific feature within your application. And uh, the third level app uh, modules, such as app module, instant app module, they will be empty. They won't really have any resources or source files. And they will be just responsible for building either our regular installable APK or instant APKs. And now let's look at the builder gradle files and basically the connections between the different modules and what we have to do in order to connect all of those components. So let's start with the builder gradle file of the base module. So the plugin is the same as in the single feature instant app. It's com.android.feature. In the default config of the Android closure, we have to set base feature attribute to true. And again, we've done the same thing in our uh, single feature instant app, right? So base module is the core of the application. This is where other modules uh, need to refer to in order to pull the information in. So you have to set this attribute to true. 
In the dependencies um, uh, closure, you can see that apart from just specifying the library dependencies that you have to pull in your application, we have to use a configuration feature project and uh, reference our uh, feature modules, right? So base module, if uh, as you remember from the diagram previously, is the foundation of the application. So uh, we need to set and tell it basically what it would, uh, what other uh, feature modules it would depend on. In our case, it's PLP, PDP, card, and order detail page. So all of those features that we built in earlier, we have to specify in the base module. One of the most important attributes that I would love to pay your attention to, not really attributes, but configuration, is application uh, project. So this configuration is important if your current application has several flavors. So if you want to propagate these flavors to your instant app, you have to set this configuration application project and give reference to your app module. And why is that important? So as you can probably understand, the location or place in our application where we specify different applications IDs, right, per flavor is in the app module, right? So in order to propagate this application IDs within instant app, we have to tell our base module where the app module lives so that the base module should pull the application IDs and propagate it to the instant app if you want to support several flavors within your instant applications. Uh, build a Gradle file of the feature module. We have a plugin called android.feature. And uh, in the dependencies block, you just have to uh, tell feature that it would depend on the base module. Well, definitely, if you have a library that you didn't pull and you didn't set in uh, the base module, and a library is being used just within one feature rather than the whole application, you can also specify this library in the feature module rather than the base module. Build a Gradle file of the app module. We'd have our well-known plugin com.android.application. Uh, and in the dependencies block, we just have to give reference to all our feature modules plus a base module. Build a Gradle file of the instant app module is very similar to the app module. The plugin is different though. It's com.android at instant app, but the dependencies block is the same as uh, the app module. So we have to give reference to all the feature modules plus the base module. So we've talked about size constraints, right? We've talked about size constraints uh, within our single feature instant app, and we mentioned that once we reach the four megabyte size limit within our base module, there is no real space to grow, and we're kind of at that end where we cannot add extra functionalities to our single feature instant app. So in the multi-feature instant app, the situation is a little bit different. So when a user clicks on a URL address, what happens is it's not only the base module that is being downloaded um, uh, on the device, right? It's a combination of the base module plus feature module, right? So just because it's a combination of both modules, we have to make sure that it's not four megabyte per base module and four megabyte per feature module. It's four megabyte per sum of base module and feature module. So, and uh, that's what happens on the first download, right? Once the user clicks on the URL address, base module and feature modules are being pulled on the device. On the subsequent download, it's not, uh, it's, it's only a feature module that is being downloaded. So the base module has been cached uh, on the first download, so it's not being pulled the second time on the device, so it's just the feature module. But we as the developers don't really know, right, which feature module would be pulled on the device. So when building instant apps, in order to make sure that you adhere to this four megabyte size limit, you have to calculate the sum of base module plus your largest feature modules and calculate that it should be no more than four megabyte size limit. And as you can probably guess, one of the useful tools uh, that will help you to keep track of the size of your application is IPK Analyzer. Uh, and uh, you have to look at the raw file size, not the download file, um, download size. And uh, which is unfortunate because as we know, download size is smaller than the raw file size. But anyway, this is what we're given and this is what we uh, have to stick to. So make sure that you will look at the raw file size number, not the download. So we've talked about slimming down the application and moving from X megabyte to four megabyte size limit. And uh, um, in, in the next, in this slide, I would love to share some practical tips and all the steps that we had to take in order to uh, reach this size limit. 
So the first thing uh, that I would probably advise you to do is please using a Gradle, um, a Gradle uh, command line um, de app dependencies, list all the dependencies that you currently use uh, in pull in your application and evaluate literally each and every dependency. So just try to estimate which dependencies are necessary within your instant app and which are not really important and you can go without. There, are, there is a list of features that are currently not being supported on instant apps. I decided not to basically provide the list because it's pretty clear and you can find it on the official Google Docs site. And w among the features, there is uh, notifications are not being supported. You cannot access external storage. Uh, there are some issues with content providers. So all of those features you will be able to find on the official Google Docs. So if there is a feature that is not being supported on instant apps and you use this feature within your installable application, try to rip it off from your instant application. And again, you can do this using different flavors of build types. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, notifications are not being supported. At Jet.com, we used AppBoy SDK. So we basically ripped it off from ins instant application and, the, and we just capped it within our regular installable application. Another probable example would be um, check out your analytics marketing and crash reporting tooling. So at Jet.com we had like three crash reporting, Firebase, Fabric, and uh, New Relic. And then we had tons of marketing, tons of analytics libraries, which in their core do the same thing. So don't keep all of them within the instant apps, remove all, and just uh, stick with one, the one that you would, uh, that would probably bring you most benefits. Plus enable ProGuard. We all know that ProGuard is uh, a pain to maintain. But in terms of instant apps, it will definitely slim, uh, slim the size, size of your application uh, tremendously. And uh, simultaneously with uh, enabling ProGuard, try to shrink your resources. So when we started before building instant apps, uh, we decided to evaluate our application and see what actually takes more memory than, um, than, than anything else in the application. And guess what? It's definitely resources, right? We had a lot of PNGs, JPEGs, JPG files. So please remove all of those and start using vector durables. You will see a huge improvement in terms of the size reduction. If you do need to use a complex image, uh, convert PNG to WebPs, because WebPs are usually 2x smaller than PNGs. And again, it's a very seamless process to do from within Android Studio, right click on the resource, and then there will be an option to convert PNG to, uh, to WebPs. So instant app uh, building process is very similar to the building process of uh, our regular installable application, except uh, one thing. So instead of getting one app APK, you will get as many APKs as there are feature modules plus one APK for the base module. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? It's not the whole application that is being pulled onto your device, right? It's a specific feature. So this feature has to be packaged separately, right? Independently. That's why it's packaged as an independent APKs. And then all of these APKs are being zipped up together and they form a zip bundle that you will be able to find within your instant app module in the build folder. So uh, after you successfully build an instant app, you are taking the zip bundle and then you're pushing it to the the uh, Google Play Store instant app release channel. And uh, basically, it's the responsibility of Google to unzip the, um, the APKs and basically push separate APKs to the device per user request. There is a very useful API that is provided uh, within the context of instant app. Um, and one of the most useful methods that we used is, uh, is instant app, which takes a context. So, and uh, this method is useful for the cases when there are some features that you wanna strip out from the instant app and keep within your regular installable application. So this flag basically helps you to identify, is your user running in the instant app context or is your user running in um, installable application context? Another use case uh, for this uh, method would be to separate your analytics data, right? You don't wanna keep all the analytics data in the same bucket. I mean, you wanna keep instant application uh, data separately and installable application data separately in order to evaluate later and see, does instant app actually bring some value to your application? So using this flag or like this method, um, you can separate the data and push it to different buckets. Uh, when building instant app, I always try to tell people, don't get scared and don't try to support all the features that you currently have within your regular installable application in instant app. Like, don't worry uh, to uh, make your instant app experience a fully flourished and go hand in hand with your regular installable application. 
So if your current installable application supports, for example, 15 features, you do need to support all of those 15 features within Instant App. So just take three features, three to five features, and see which ones are, will be more valuable, right? And which ones can bring more benefit in terms of Instant Apps, and try to build just a subset of features. So, and... Uh, then you can push this uh, probably light version of Instant Apps to the Google Play Store. And once the users start engaging with your Instant App, you can, uh, you can drive them into your regular installable application. So there is a very helpful method, show install prompt. And uh, again, provided by the Instant App API. So when the user clicks on the install button, right, the user will, be, will automatically download your regular installable application. So Instant App can be kind of like a gateway into your regular installable application and uh, kind of like an engagement um, attraction, right, to your users. So, um, and um, yeah, the, the process of installation, again, is very seamless. Once the user is in the Instant App context, they don't have to go to Google Play Store to install the application. It can be seamlessly done from within Instant App. So we've talked a lot about uh, modularizing, we've talked about size constraints, different types of instant apps. And uh, I think that the next few slides will be more important for you as developers if you decide to build instant apps. Because when we were working with instant apps, there were, uh, so the, the tooling was experimental and we were actually early access um, a partner um, of the Google program. So uh, we ran into a lot of issues and we kind of wasted some time on certain bugs and inconsistencies that we ran into. So we'd love to share with you all those crashes, uh, all the things that don't work, all the things that can be improved um, in the next few slides. So imagine we're build, uh, building our instant app, and um, then we're running into an issue where version code is specified as zero, which is inconsistent with the version code 494, right? And uh, so definitely my first intuitive thought would be, I have to go to the uh, base module and see whether the version code is specified as 494 or zero, right? Where does the zero coming from? As you can probably guess, we were able to verify that the uh, base module has the version code set as 494. And uh, so if we look closer at the error, right, we can see that it's a PDP module or library that is displaying this version code zero. But why? PDP as a feature module depends on the base module, right? So if it depends on the base module, it has to pull the version code and version name from the base module, right? That's like a common sense, it makes sense. Well, it makes sense to everybody, I mean, to everybody except um, it's not working this way. Google is aware of the issue and they are fixing it currently. So in order to get rid of this error, you have to manually specify version code in the base module as well as all the feature modules. So the, um, the version code and version name is not being propagated to feature modules. Just make sure you will set it manually. Again, hopefully Google will fix it in the next iterations. Um, Another issue that we ran into with it was uh, a lot of errors, uh, no such method error, no such field name errors within Instant Apps. And uh, why was that happening? We had ProGuard enabled in our regular installable application, but ProGuard broke a lot of things in Instant Apps. And the issue is uh, because ProGuard is not smart enough to establish the dependencies between different modules. So um, in order to resolve all this no such method or field name errors, we have to add extra ProGuard rules to the ProGuard file uh, within uh, within your uh, feature module. So, I mean, it may be a little bit tedious, but once you add extra ProGuard rules into your file, per classes that are being stripped off, you will be good to go. Uh, probably one of my least favorite um, crash and issue that we ran into and took a lot of time to debug is uh, connected with resources. So you can see that I have a toolbar widget, right? And uh, this toolbar widget has an ID r.id toolbar. And uh, for some reason, the r.id toolbar is not being found, right? So the, the app couldn't resolve the resource. And uh, my first intuitive thought was, okay, I need to go to the XML file and figure out, is there a toolbar? And probably I messed up the ID, it's not a toolbar. And again, as you can probably guess, nothing is that simple. So I was able to verify that there is a toolbar and the ID of the toolbar is r.id.toolbar. So, and when we started to look deeper into the problem, we realized that the XML file with this resource was defined in the base module, but it was used in a feature module. So, and uh, just because uh, base module and feature modules would have different package names, right, 
Android would generate different resource packages for different modules. So in order to solve this issue, we do need just to specify a resource ID that we define in the XML file. We have to specify a full resource ID. And a full resource ID is prepackaged uh, by the, I mean, sorry, prepackaged, prefixed by, uh, with, a, with a package where this resource is defined. Again, this, just to reiterate, this area, uh, this area um, arouses only in cases where you define your resource in a base module and use it in a feature modules. So in this case, you have to specify a full resource ID, not just the resource ID that you set in your XML file. Uh, currently reusable layouts are not uh, being supported in feature modules, so such tags as in merge and include work fine in um, base module, but in feature modules uh, there will be some resource issues. And unfortunately I don't have a workaround for that, uh, so we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to um, solve this issue, but what we ended up doing is just remove, uh, remove reusable layout tags in uh, layouts and basically nest layouts. I know this is not a pretty solution, uh, but uh, yeah, Google is aware of the, uh, of the issue. Hopefully they will fix it in the next iterations of Instanaps. Just be aware, merge and include tags won't work in feature modules. One of my favorite error was, okay, we're building Instanap, it's fine, it's running, it's not crashing, and there is nothing to display. And the issue is that everything should be done through HTTPS, so make sure it's uh, TLS protocols, no HTTP. So I would love to sum up the presentation with the benefits that we gained um, within, like when we were building Instant App. And one of the first benefits, as you can probably all guess, is a size reduction. So we were able to slim down our application from over 17 megabyte size limit to a little bit less than seven megabyte size limit. And we went from multi-dex to a single dex. If we're talking about instant app, our current instant app size is a little bit less than four megabyte per module, which is pretty impressive. So we've done a lot of modularization and probably this is one of the most uh, important gains uh, for me was as a developer because when I joined Jet.com, the application was a little bit messy. Everything was in one module. It was really hard to navigate between features and basically establish the connections. And each and every developer that joined the team basically felt this pain, right? It was really hard to like navigate in the app, figure out where I will put the next feature. So currently, it's such a delightful experience to open, you know, open Android Studio and see everything well packaged and everything well organized. Um, within the um, application. We've done a lot of code cleaning up as we were modularizing the app. One of the things that I would love to mention is Instant App is a very smooth, fast, and performant experience. So there are some features that you as developers have to integrate as part of Instant Apps, such as Smart Lock. So if you're doing some account management logic, you have to make sure that you're using Smart Lock API in order to basically remove this tab of making uh, users manually type in passwords. Again, it's done for the sake of making uh, Instant App experience smooth and frictionless. Um, if you're uh, charging uh, your users for like a certain services or products that you're selling or doing, you have to use Google Payments. Um, so again, it's, it's done for the sake of making Instant App very smooth experience. So don't worry that uh, all the um, basically financial part that is currently uh, included in your application, in your regularly installable application, won't work within Instant Apps. That's not the case. So at Jet.com, we rely on Braintree, right? So Braintree is still there. All the users, all the uh, old users, right, or all the existing users of the application can easily check out with all the credit or debit cards that have been um, associated with the account before Instant Apps, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's not an issue. It's just for new users, right, when they will be checking out within your Instant application, you have to drive them through uh, Google Payments. Um, another thing that we've uh, gained, and uh, it was impressive, is a conversion rate of 27%. And uh, that was, no, 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 we messed something up. It's, it's impossible. 27%, it's like, where, where, does this come, where does this number come from? So we were super, um, super, um, how to put it nicely? Super worried about this number, right? We didn't want to let anybody know about this number because we thought that we messed something up on our side. So we enabled extra analytics and uh, like on our side in order to actually confirm this number. And so uh, believe it or not, but this is the true data that we received from several um, analytics tools that we've um, integrated in order to confirm that the number is actually 27%. Another important gain that our business got is card size increased by 7%. So instant up experience 
experience is so smooth and frictionless that most um, all of our users are spending more time with an instant application and they spend more money. So it was uh, a really nice um, addition in terms of uh, financial benefits uh, when we built instant apps. So I would love probably to um, focus um, on one thing. Instant app is not only about building this new type of the application that will bring benefits uh, to your uh, to your company and business. So Instant app for us was a really multi way of gaining things. So we were able to improve our installable application, we're able to modularize the code, and we were able to bring a lot of benefits to our business. So um, yeah, just try it, give it a try, see uh, how it goes. Uh, if there are some issues, please reach out to me at Twitter. I'm pretty active. We'll be happy to answer all the questions or provide some uh, guidance in terms of building instant apps. Thank you, guys. I think we have some time for the questions, do we? I think we do. If there are some questions, guys, yeah. Okay, sure. So I'll answer probably the second question because I don't remember the first one. So <laughs> the second question was, um, so if I'm, uh, is, is there is a roadmap, right, or a plan how we can migrate from the uh, app module to like a modularized code and to support instant apps, is that right? So in terms of modularization, I basically showed you the steps, right? And uh, the first thing that you need to do, just take one feature within your regular inst installable application, put it in a separate module, put all of the code in a separate module, right? And create a base module. And base module would be your networking, analytics, and et cetera. So all of those reusable components. And just build one APK, just build one feature. Um, and then if everything goes well, you're adding another one, so you're pulling everything from the app module, putting it in another module, so it's basically a step-by-step process. In terms of the uh, architecture, uh, there is no you know, a specific uh, thing that I would recommend. Whatever architecture works in your application, you can use. So in our case, we're using MVP pattern, right? So basically, model views presenters are being located within the, uh, within the feature modules, right? If some presenters are being reused between different features, we put this presenter into the into the base module so that it should be propagated to both to both feature modules so any pattern any design right um, would work uh, yeah in terms of modularization it's basically one feature per mod per module does, does that make sense okay so sure, yeah Remember that question. So the question was, uh, so if I'm including some uh, third-party libraries and dependencies, right, how does this impact my size? Well, it impacts your size, uh, the APK size, directly. So the more libraries and dependencies you will pull in the application, right, uh, the bigger your APK will become. So, I mean, there is no extra steps that you have to do in order to support these dependencies. Basically, these dependencies will be pulled, like, through JSON or Maven, whatever, it will, like, wherever you're choosing to pulling them uh, from. And, uh, yeah, they will be working just like regular dependencies within your regular installable um, installable application. So there are no extra steps that you have to do. But you have to be mindful in order not to pull a lot of dependencies because you will pretty quickly reach the size uh, limit of four megabytes. Sure. Awesome, great question. So uh, I have a PLP module, right? Uh, I'm just repeating the question. So I have a PLP module. If the user clicks on a product, uh, what happens the next, right? So in our case, we had a PLP module and we had a PDP module, two independent modules, right? So if the user clicks on a product on the PLP module, the user, so the PDP module will be automatically downloaded on the device, so they will be living next to each other, and the user seamlessly will go to the PDP module. So um, again, I've showed it from the demo when I was navigating from the PLP to the uh, to the home module. So it's actually two different modules. And the process is very seamless. That progress bar that you've seen on the first download is being showed only on the first download. On the subsequent download of another feature modules, you will never see this. So it's as if the user is navigating within like a truly native experience between modules. So the, the experience is smooth. And uh, again, returning to your question, if I'm navigating from the PLP module to the PDP module, module, PLP has, in our case, it has, uh, I think it's like two activities currently, and uh, yeah, they basically form one feature, and PDP has one activity, like with like, extra components, and um, it, the only thing that we're doing is we're passing the ID, right, of the of the product to the P PDP module, and then we're hitting our backend and uh, pulling the information about the product from the, um, from the, um, yeah, from the
the PDP module. And again, it's being passed through uh, through URI intents. So you can basically append ID of the product as path uh, to your URL address. So PLC mod, uh, the PLC module doesn't have the PDP No, it doesn't. Because PLP and PDP, two totally independent components and uh, independent feature modules, they do have shared components, except the components that they're pulling from the base module. As I mentioned, uh, it's four megabyte for a combination of base module and the largest feature module, right? So you have to make sure when you're building instant apps that you evaluate the size of your uh, largest feature module and sum it with the base module. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, good question. I uh, I had a lot of people reaching out and asking questions about data binding. As far as I know, it works fine. Um, yeah, we don't use it. I have my my, my firm standpoint in terms of data binding. Oh, I'm I'm not really aware. Actually, I w I can share the mm, uh, the link of uh, of the blog post that I wrote on Medium, and there was a guy who reached out to me and asked about data binding. And after um yeah, I wasn't actually able to help him because we're not using data binding. But he was able to find the solution, and he's like, I'm fine. I'm like unblocked. So if you want, I can I can probably connect you, and you can talk to him what what they have done. So. Yep, sure. Uh, great question. So how do we actually manage sessions, right? Uh, in terms of migrating from the from the feature modules or migrating from the instant app to the to the to the installable application? So basically the in, like when you navigate within instant application between your feature modules, the data is being associated in our case, right, with like a card ID, right, or a client. So every time I'm uh, going to a different to a different module, right, uh, we're pulling the information not specifically about the user, but like the card. So the the, the information uh, is not being lost when you are navigating between feature modules because it's still the same application, right? So you can use like shared preference and like no data is being lost when you navigate between different feature modules. Uh, a thing to keep in mind if, uh, is if you're trying to go from the instant app to the uh, regular installable application, and uh, there are some extra steps that you have to take in order to pull the information from the instant app to the app module. So if we are talking about Android 8, right, API level 26, then all the data is being transferred automatically. There is nothing you have to do, guys, on your side. But if you're talking about lower API levels, uh, then there is uh, a method that you have to invoke within your regular installable application, and the method is get instant app data, and so you will be able to get all the uh, all the data from the uh, from your uh, instant applications. But when you are navigating between different IPKs within the same application, the data is not being lost. Uh, sure, it can be as a metadata. The question is, you're building feature modules, so for example, your uh, so the feature modules are independent, right? How would you navigate between different feature modules? You have to basically trigger the download of the feature module, right? And in order to trigger the download, you have to specify, you have to create an intent filter that you would associate it with that with that activity. If you don't have the activity, you will never be able to launch a feature module. That's that's the main issue. I think we don't really have uh, time left, right? So that's it. Guys, again, thank you so much. Reach, uh, reach me on Twitter if you have questions.